Amen. Okay, well, the day has finally come where we will cover assignment number five. Like I said, it's been uh, three weeks since we've, <laughs> or two weeks delay, uh, but that's, that's fine. I think we have time in our schedule. We can do that and give you guys more time to get your assignments done and get caught up. Um, so assignment number five is, uh, the focus of this assignment is the diagram, diagramming your passage, the structural diagram, making specific observations of some of the grammatical features in your passage, and then word studies. Okay, so this is getting to the to the smaller pieces and looking at uh, the grammar, looking at uh, uh, definitions of specific words. Um, so that's where we're at in the process. So we've moved from the poetic analysis, the parallelism, the imagery, uh, the figurative language. Now we're focused on some of the, the, the grammatical features of, uh, of the passage. And so here again, I have, uh, we're gonna go through Proverbs 1, uh, 8 through 19 as our example for this um, uh, assignment. Uh, you have the details as far as particular pages in the manuals and also the workshop sessions that we've covered this material um, before going through the Psalms. So uh, there are more details there that you can examine. Uh, but for this assignment, we're going to focus on a Proverbs passage since that is what uh, you guys will be doing uh, as well. You have Proverbs text that you're studying. So let's just re remind ourselves quickly of the, the diagram, the steps here for this assignment. The first step of this assignment, number five, for your Proverbs passage is to complete the structural diagram for the entire poem. Not the whole chapter, just your, your poem. All right. The, the verses that uh, comprise your, your text only. Uh, second, is to take the diagram and make some textual observations of that poem. So um, you'll be looking for at the verbs, uh, the pronouns, um, any conditional clauses. I'll show you it's just a few things that I want you to look for uh, in your passage. And then the third step is to conduct a word study on at least five significant words in the poem. Okay, so we'll talk about that as well. So these are the three steps for this assignment. Okay, so looking first at the structural diagram, this is the part that'll probably take you the most time. And again, back in sessions eight, nine, and 10, or eight and nine, we covered uh, a lot of that in detail. Let's look at it for this, this Proverbs text. And before we do that, I'm gonna just have us read. This is the example passage we're going to look at today, but let's go ahead and read it, all right? Um, maybe I'll ask, good morning, Eric. I'm gonna ask if, you could read uh, verses 8 to 10, and then, good morning, Pastor Ramil, if you could read verses 11 through 13. Um, Ruel, I'll have you read verses uh, 14 through 16, and then, uh, Kent, why don't you go ahead and read uh, 17 to 19, okay? So, Eric, if you could start us, verses 8 through 10. Is your uh, microphone working? There we go. Good morning. Good morning, Pastor Tim. Good morning, everyone. Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Indeed, they are graceful writ to your head and ornaments about your neck. Up to verse 10? Uh, yes, verse 10. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. Verse 11. If they say... Come with us, let us lie in wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like shoal, even whole as those who go down to the pit. We will find all kinds of precious wealth. We will fill our houses with spoil. Uh, verse 14. 
throw in your lot with us, we shall all have one purse. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your feet from their path, for their feet run to evil, and they hasten to shed blood. Verse 17, Indeed, it is useless to spread the baited net in the sight of any bird, but they lie in wait for their own blood. They ambush their own lives. So are the ways of everyone who gains by violence. It takes away the life of its possessors. You're mute. Got it. Sorry about that. We'll take this passage and uh, just we'll diagram a little bit. I don't think we'll have time to do the whole thing. Just to review, remind you how to do that. And let's remember that uh, parallelism is what we do to look at the how um, the, ver the lines are connected within a verse. Uh, the structural diagram helps us to see how uh, these phrases and clauses are connected between the verses. So it's to look at the poem as a whole, whereas parallelism, we're just looking at each verse and how the lines in that verse are connected to each other. But the diagram will, will look at the passage as a whole. Okay, And so the first step this are, these are the four steps to do the diagram, if you remember. First, you want to identify the main sentence, the main subject and verb. That's what starts on the left of your diagram. And then you want to identify the phrases and clauses. And if you remember, uh, we identify those by finding the connector words. Okay, the conjunctions, the prepositions, the prona relative pronouns, the participles, and also punctuation marks. And then we ask the question, what does that phrase or clause modify and how? And then finally, move that phrase or clause under the word that it modifies. Okay, so that's the basic procedure for the structural diagram. So let's just take the passage we have here. And the first step is to identify the main sentence. All right, I, now I have... Uh, divided it here into three stanzas because that's from the previous analysis of the setting and structure back in, uh, what is it, was it assignment two? Um, in that assignment, I determined in the, my study of this passage, there were three paragraphs, three stanzas, excuse me, in, the, in my section. Okay, and so that's why I've separated them. And so I want to find the main sentence in each paragraph. Okay, so if we're looking at verses eight and nine as the first stanza, um, let me ask uh, German, good morning. Let me ask you, give you an opportunity here. Can you identify a, a main sentence in this first paragraph, verses eight and nine? And make sure to unmute yourself. You're still muted there, brother. There you go. Uh, pardon, uh, pardon, Pastor Tim, because uh, my signal here is so poor. Oh, can you hear me okay? Okay, okay. All right, why don't you uh, give it a try? Your, your audio is clear. Okay. Okay, um, your audio is uh, okay. Cl clear, clear. Your sound is clear. Okay, good. Uh, can you identify the main sentence in uh, this first paragraph, the main verb and subject? What do you think it is? So the main verb is here. Yes, good. Another verb is forsake. Yeah, good. Do not forsake. And notice... They're connected by and, so these are two main sentences Do not here. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. And then... Um, uh, linking, uh, the linking verb is R. The R. Yeah, that will be... Okay, good. The connecting sentence that, that will modify uh, something in the verse 8. But I think, yeah, here your father's instruction. Do not forsake your mother's teaching. Those are are two 
uh, the two main sentences connected together, and then we'll look at the verse nine in a minute. All right, good. Uh, second paragraph. Let's do that one. Um, let's see. Kenneth, are you there? Pastor Kenneth? I'm here, Pastor Dave. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Can you identify the main sentence in the second paragraph? And again, normally it's near the beginning. Yeah, the, the main sentence is uh, in verse 10, do not consent. Good. Main Good. sentence or main sentences? <laughs> well, that's the main sentence and everything else is going to connect to it, um, which we'll see in okay. the following steps. You could even include my son, do not consent. Oh, yeah, that's good. All right, good. And then the, the third paragraph would be similar. My son, do not do walk. Not walk okay. And then keep your feet uh, from their path. Okay, so just like when we look at a paragraph in an epistle, in a stanza, normally the main sentence or will come near the beginning. All right. Now, often in poetry, you'll have many parallel um main sentences uh, together connected by and and but uh, so keep that in mind but for the proverbs typically they're more like a paragraph in one sense in that you'll see a main sentence at the beginning and then the rest of the the poem will will follow that modify it in some way so so that here we have that now let's do the second step where we're going to look at the phrases and clauses. Now things are going to get a little, little bit more challenging. Here I've highlighted the main sentence in each paragraph, just like we just did. Um, now I'm going to ask uh, Ruel here. In this first paragraph, identify for me the phrases and clauses. In other words, look for any of these connector words, conjunctions, prepositions, pronoun, relative pronoun, or participles. Okay, to, so that we can know where do I break up this uh, this paragraph? Okay, so does that make sense? What I'm asking? Yeah. Okay, so where's the first phrase? Uh, first phrase is "Hear my son." Okay, hear my son. Well, that's part of that sentence, right? Hear your father's instruction, right? Yeah. And then we have, what do we have right after that? The and. And. Conjunction. Yes. So that's where we break it, right? As a conjunction. Do not forsake your mother's teaching. Where do I, where's the next break? Teaching. Yeah. And why, why would you say that? Because of the word indeed. Yeah, indeed, and we have a punctuation mark there, right? The semicolon. Mm. Indeed. Now, yeah. where's the next break? Where do you see another connector word? And. Head. Uh, okay. They are graceful to your head there? and okay. ornament about their neck. Okay. Do you see any other breaks here? Any prepositions or conjunctions? To your head about yeah the there you go to your head and then Ab about yeah very good okay good so those are all the phrases and clauses in the first paragraph all right let's do the same thing in the second paragraph uh joshua why don't you help us out here starting in verse 10 um can you identify where do we any con connector words where we break up this paragraph or punctuation okay, or um, wait uh, my son and I think there's a separation if sinners entice you yeah that word if that's a conjunction yeah. okay and then we have that other comma. So this is the rest of that sentence. All right, good. Where's the next break after? 
do not consent. Okay, good. Because this notice if we have another connector word there, if they say. Okay, where would I break it yeah. next? And then separate that do not consent. And then another if. Okay. If. Uh, if they say, I think on come. Yeah, now it's a quote, right? Come. So we'll come with us. All right. Where would I, where's the next break? Uh, let us lie. Yeah. The translators put a comma there. So there's a, they're telling us this is a new, new clause here. Where's the next one? It's like, um, Again, look for connector words, prepositions, conjunctions, participles. What's that? Let us ambush. Okay, here. Let us ambush. Oh, wait. Yeah. Yeah, notice there's a preposition oh, yeah, yeah. here, right? For blood. Okay, let us ambush the innocent. Another let us swallow them online. Oh, wait. Let's ambush the innocent. Without. Yeah, good. Without. We... Good. Then let us swallow them alive. Let's swallow them uh, before alive. Here? Yeah. Is alive a connector word? I wait. No. No, it's not, right? It's a verb. No, no. How about here? Like shield. Ah, okay. Yeah. All right. Where's the next one? Even. Next. Yeah, good. Very good. And we have a comma there that helps us out a little. Then ask. Uh, yeah, good. As is a conjunction. Who? Good. Relative pronoun. Who? Good job. Uh, we. Okay, we. And we've got two here. Don't forget that one. All right. We will find all okay. kinds. Oh yeah, two. Uh, we'll find, we'll find uh, all the kinds. So here, is yeah, that what uh, is all of, a connector word? Okay, uh, of good. Let's go back here and ask. Though, is is all a connector word? I know, no, I it's don't not right. So. No, it's not. Yeah. Okay, so of precious wealth, we will fill. So where's the next? We. Good. With. Good. Throw. Okay. With. We. We. There you go. That's it. Good job. All right. Now I'm going to skip this next paragraph just for the sake of um, uh, time, but that just gives you an idea. Again, remember in that step, you're just looking for connector words, which are conjunctions, prepositions, the relative pronoun. There's only four of those to worry about. The participles, which are verbs of ing endings, and then punctuation marks are also a really helpful guide. Okay. And so once you've done that, we've separated all of these phrases and clauses uh, in the paragraph, in the stanza. Then the next step is to um, ask ourselves, how does it function in the sentence here? What is it doing? Okay, and so here I have all the phrases and clauses separated. So the next question we wanna ask is, what is this phrase or clause doing? So, We've already identified the main sentence. So here, this one is just simply, this is the main sentence, all right? And then actually there are 
uh, another main main clause, main sentence, and then it looks like a third. So he's making three parallel statements here. They're all of equal importance. One, hear your father's instruction. Two, do not forsake your mother's teaching. And three, they are a graceful wreath. Okay? So those first three are, are our main clause, our main idea. Now to your head, what's that phrase doing? What's it describing? What, what question is it answering? Um, okay, Kent, Where? go ahead. Where? Where? Yeah, it's a location, right? So basically where uh, they are a graceful wreath or where they are a wreath, okay? So it's going to modify R. It's telling us where they are this thing, okay? And ornaments. What is that connected to? They are ornaments. Yes. So it's going to be they are graceful wreath and they are ornaments, all right? So we could say connected to wreath, okay? And then finally, about your neck. What kind of uh, question might that be answering? What? Okay, what? But Okay, what? Hey. What kind of ornament? Is that what you're saying? Okay, or it could be where the ornaments are located, right? Yes. Because above we had to your head, and here is about your neck. Yeah. Okay? So it's one or the other of these, all right? If it's what kind of ornaments, then it's modifying ornaments. If it is where, then it's going to modify again the verb. Because remember, here, guys, the phrase or clause modifies a verb if it answers the question why, when, where, or how. But if your phrase or clause answers the question who, which, how many, what kind, a description, then it's going to modify a noun. Mm. Okay? So if we say about your neck is uh, describing the ornaments, then it would be modifying ornaments. What kind of ornaments? Or if we say about your neck actually is telling us where the ornaments are located, then it's going to modify a verb. Or again, our, our, which is the verb here. All right, so those are the, the things you're, you're going to be trying to answer as you go through each of these. Um, okay, so let's go to the next. My son, that's a direct address, right? And the main sentence here, the main clause of this second stanza is, do not consent. Now, what is this one doing here? If sinners entice you, what is that connected to? What do you think it's modifying? The one next to it, the do not consent. It's a conditional clause. Do not consent if sinners entice you. Okay, good. So it modifies the verb consent. Okay. It modifies that verb because it's telling us this action only takes place if the condition is met. So, for example, if, a, if sinners do not entice you, then, then you don't do the action, right? But if sinners do entice you, then don't consent. That's the idea. Okay, now I'll show you in the diagram in a minute what this looks like. Okay, and we have a second one. If they say, again... It's a conditional clause, and it modifies consent. So he's giving here two conditional statements. If they try to entice you, don't consent. If they say, and then he'll tell us. Now, the whole rest of this, verses 11 through 14, is uh, what they say, okay? So all of these are parallel statements. Let us lie in wait. Let us ambush. Let us swallow. We will find. We will fill. Throw in your lot. Those are all parallel statements that are under say. It's what they say. 
okay? So let me just show you this in the diagram. Let's skip this part. I don't know, hopefully you guys can see this here. So what I did here is I just took, I took, um, you know, in the second, in that second step or, or third step where we identify what the phrase is doing. So I take that and now I'm going to make my diagram. All right. So here, my son, your father's instruction, that's a main clause. And so this is parallel to it. And an implied subject is you do not forsake your mother's teaching. And again, another independent or main clause. Indeed, they are a graceful wreath. Now, to your head, we said this modifies where, where they are a graceful wreath. So it's going to go under R. Okay, because it's answering the question where, that means this phrase is going to modify a verb. It's telling us something about the verb. In this case, where the verb is happens and in this case that verb is are where are they a graceful wreath to your head and they are um so we could do this a graceful wreath and ornaments okay so i'm lining this up with uh oh sorry let's do it here So I'm lining this up with a graceful wreath, a graceful wreath and ornaments. All right. Now about your neck, I took as a, a describing a location. So I have it modifying. They are okay. Ornaments about your neck. Now, if you think it's, it's describing the ornaments, you would put it like this and that would say what kind of, what kind of ornaments. Okay. Those are the two options, but um, I think he's doing it. It's a parallel idea, right? Because here it's to your head. That's a location. And then ornaments about your neck. And this is what, remember, we, we have ellipsis here. So it's actually saying this. If this helps you to see it a little easier. Okay. All right. Does, does this make sense so far? Uh, hopefully this is just review, but any questions on this first? All we're doing is from the previous step where we broke up all of these phrases and clauses, and then we identified, okay, how is each phrase or clause, what is it doing? How is it working in this uh, sentence? Now we're simply just lining up each phrase and clause under the word it modifies. All right, so this next paragraph, it begins with a direct address, my son. And the main sentence was, my son, do not consent. Okay, and the implied subject is you. Now, we said this, if sinners entice you, is modifying the verb because it is telling us the condition for the verb to happen. Do not consent will only happen if sinners entice you. Or secondly, if they say. Okay, so these are two conditional statements connected to the verb do not consent. And that's why I have uh, the first, and I followed the word order of the passage. So that's why I have the first uh the first conditional statement above do not consent and then the second one below because I'm just following the word order. So if you're preaching this passage now, by the way, how many conditions do you have related to the command do not consent? Two. You have two, right? So you would say there are two conditions that... Solomon here is telling his son, do not consent in these two situations. If they entice you, 
And if they say, and if they say, now, if they say that's how they would entice, right? Now, what I do with this one is, uh, these are all independent clauses within the quotation. So this is how I would handle it. Let me, um, I think it'd probably be easier if I, let's see, we go down to, what is it? Verse 15, that's the end of that. So let's do this. I'll see if I've got space. Now, what I do with this is this is kind of, this is a quote really, right? Because it's what they, if they say. So what I do is I, I put it in. Um, let me do that. I'll just do this and then I'll explain it. Okay, so these are all. Okay, I'll explain in a second. I'm just going to go ahead and line up. Okay, so notice first, notice that I'm putting them all under say. All right, because all of this is a part of a quote, basically. It's what they say. So I'm, that's why I'm combining it together. And then each of these statements here are independent uh clauses meaning they can stand alone and they're parallel so come with us all right comes a verb here and then let us lie in wait okay that's the the statement they're making let us ambush another parallel statement now lie in wait for blood why did i put that under lie in wait Why answering the question? Why why they are lying? In yeah. Wait? Notice I put the question there. Why are they lying in wait? So it's modifying the action. They're lying in wait for blood, or that's a an idiom that means you know to harm or kill. Right? Why do we lie and let us lie in wait? Why? For blood. Let us ambush the innocent. Why? Without cause. Wala lang. Wala lang. Wala lang. Rip, yeah. rip lang. Let us swallow them alive. How? Like Sheol swallows. And then how? Mm -hmm. Even hold. All three of these modify swallow. They're telling us how to swallow. How we should swallow. And then who go down. That who is telling us that modifies those. Okay. Those who go down where? That's going to modify go down. That's going to modify the verb, the action, because it's telling us where. Okay? And then another, here's another verse 13, another statement. Again, in parallel with all of these, we will find all kinds, which kinds? Of precious wealth. Another parallel statement. We will fill our houses. And then uh, I put, you know, this as far as is content. So I put it under fill. Let me underline these. Okay, throw in your lot. Where? Where are you going to throw is with us. And then finally, we shall have one purse. Okay, so this is how I do this because this is a quote i just put all of this in a box as part of the quote um and that should be well it's format All right, so you guys see that? So I just put a box around. All of this is part of their quote. And basically their quote is just a series of these 
statements, right? Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight declarations or eight, eight enticements that the sinners are giving. Okay. So, Pastor Tim, it's similar to a list. Yes. Yes. It's very much, it's a list. It's a list of, of basically commands, right? Come with us. Let us lie in wait. That's the form of a command in the third person. Let's ambush. Let's swallow. And then throw in your lot. Okay, those are all commands. But it's a list. Good. It's a list of eight. Eight of them. Okay. And then there's some phrases underneath here that modify as I've shown. All right. Any question on that? That's the second paragraph. And you follow that procedure. Let me just show you that. I'll show you the full diagram here. And again, I'm going to send this to you, uh, you know, after we're done this morning. So you'll have this example and you can study it more carefully if you have more questions. But so here, just notice, okay, here's the first paragraph, verses eight to 10. And then I have the second pair. So the first paragraph has these three, two commands, and then one declaration. Now, one could say this, this third line here is actually modifying the verbs. It's giving us a result. Okay, that's a possibility. Keep in mind. Now, the second paragraph, verses 10 to 14, is what I just showed you. And in this one, there's just one command. My son, do not consent. And then it's modified by these two conditional statements. All right, but this second paragraph really is one focus. Solomon says, don't consent. And then all the rest of the paragraph is underneath the these uh, conditional statements okay so if you're preaching these would be things you would say consider like uh, things that people might say to entice you to to commit evil all right and just notice how they they do it and then finally the third paragraph is here which I diagrammed and you can again you can go through that on your own and see how I did it, all right? Now, for your assignment, you don't have to put all those steps that I showed you. For your assignment, all you need to show me is just the diagram, okay? So you don't have to do like we did, break up each phrase and clause and identify how it functions. Just, just give me your diagram. That's all you need to do, okay? And then if you have separate stanzas, you could separate them by a space. But I think many of you just have one stanza, if I remember right. Okay, and so what this does is this diagram now helps us see how do the, what are the connections between the verses in this poem? Again, parallelism just looks at each, each line within a verse. But the diagram shows us how the whole stanza is structured. So again, in the first stanza, we really have two commands. The second stanza is also a command. It's one command from Solomon with these two conditional statements. The third stanza is again two commands with a uh, and then a, uh, a statement by Solomon about the consequences of following these sinners. All right. Any any uh, questions on that? I know diagramming is the favorite your favorite thing in the world. I know you love to do it every day. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's it's important because again, as as we've said many times, uh, when we're studying a passage, we're trying to look at it from different 
perspectives. We're looking at different things with each of these steps. And so this step in the diagram is, is trying to force us to think about how do, how do these things all connect? So for example, I can see in, in this second stanza, I can see the structure. And it's very clear there's just one command given by the author. And all the rest of this essentially modifies that command. Okay? So when I'm preaching this passage, I'm not going to be preaching on, you know, these verse 13 as the main idea. The main idea is verse 10. Don't consent. Okay? Verse 13 is part of what sinners would say to someone to try to entice them or try to convince them to join them in sin. Okay? But the main idea of the second stanza is don't join them. Don't consent. All right. Pastor and, Tim. Yes. Uh, Pastor Tim, yes, can sir. we preach this Proverbs 1, verse 8 to 19 in just one setting? Or can we preach it in three settings? It's up to you. Um, sometimes, right, you'll have... Uh, enough material and eat from each paragraph that you might do it separately in three parts. Or you might see that, you know, there's a basic common theme here, right? The first yes. stanza is just, hey, follow the wisdom of your parents, right? That would be my first point in this sermon is, um, you know, consider the wisdom of, of those, you know, the mature in the faith right? And treat them as valuable, right? The wisdom of our fathers, the wisdom of scripture is valuable. And then the second, my second point would be, don't give in to temptations of others, okay? And the third point is essentially the same idea, is do not follow in the path of, of the wicked. But I could spend you know, I could do a separate message on each one of these paragraphs. You know, the first message could be just a, a, a sermon on the value of wisdom from, from others that are mature. If you, you know, you might feel that those in your congregation need to hear this. And this is an important point that you want them to be seeking wisdom. You want them to be uh, talking to those who are older in the faith and mature. So maybe you, you would spend a whole message on just verses eight and nine. Um, or maybe, you know, verses 10 to 14, you might say, you know, uh, this would be important just to do one message on this because it describes how, how uh, a, a ways that sinners might seek to tempt us. And so maybe this would be a good opportunity to, focus a whole message on that all right or you can like i said do the whole the whole uh all three together okay okay does that answer Thank your you, question pastor yes pastor team okay but so man you the sermons yeah you you could now for your assignment only one sermon <laughs> 30 minutes all right <laughs> for your passage for uh, for the class but yeah if you're going through this in your congregation then uh you have the freedom to decide you know should i do one sermon on each paragraph because there's some important principles here or or i could say you know i'll just do the whole the whole thing because the whole thing focuses on not following in the path of of evildoers especially those who commit violence all right so this is actually a good passage for young men isn't it yes you know because they can be tempted to want to go and join another you know we call them uh, hooligans right or other young men who like to cause trouble and stir up violence and problems so but the diagram sort of just helps us to see how the different phrases and clauses uh, connect to each other within each stanza. Okay. 
All right. Good morning to those of us, uh, those of you who have uh, joined us a little late. Good to see you. Pastor Sandy, Jess, Pastor Jess, good to see you. Good morning. I see some flames coming out from Sandy's uh, from Sandy's shirt there. You got a red shirt. <laughs> okay, let me uh, take us to the next section. And so the first step in assignment number five is putting together your diagram. And again, you don't have to do all the steps for that. Just show me your diagram in the assignment. All right. Now, the second step is to then take take that your passage and make textual observations of it. And, and again, not the whole chapter, just your passage. And there's a few categories that I want you to focus on. All right. Uh, verbs, the pronouns, any conjunctions, any conditional cause, clauses, or any purpose result statements. All right. Um, you could also add to that if you want to look at, you know, identify lists, and some of the other features, but but the ones I've put here are what I think are most important. So then what it is, is just go back and go through each verse and first look at the verbs. And if you can remember, there are three characteristics uh, of verbs, all right? And that is first the tense. Okay. Um, Ramil, can you tell me what are the different tenses, verb tenses in English? Present. Oh, okay, Sandy, go ahead. <laughs> Present. Future. Future. Past, I think. Past. Yeah. All right, so Ramil, we'll give you the next one. What about, what is a voice? Do you remember voice, Ramil? Is he getting help? <laughs> active. active and passive. Active and passive. There you go. All right. Now, a little tougher one, the mood. Anyone remember there's like five moods in English? Anyone know? Indicative, in, indicative mode, subjective okay. mode. Junctive. Okay, indicative. Deep. Subjunctive. Interrogative. Interrogative. And the then, the grammar interjection. Man. What's that? Interjection. Okay, could be interjection. Uh, I think conditional is the one, one of them. I don't focus on that one so much. These first four are important. So imperative, right? Command. Indicative. That's a statement. Declaration. Subjunctive. That's a possibility. And then interrogative, that's a question. Okay, so we want to identify with each of these three characteristics for each verb. Because what you're going to do is then step back and ask, okay, is there mostly imperatives in this passage or are mostly uh, indicatives or questions? So, so for example, and I'm going to have you guys help me with this, but I'll do the first verse. So verse eight. Um, I'm going to find my verb. So here and forsake, do not forsake are the two verbs. So here is present tense. It's active, right? The subject's doing the action and it's imperative. It's a command. Command. Okay. And then forsake is present, active, imperative also. Okay. So both of these are commands. All right, Pastor German, I'm going to give you verse 9. Identify the verbs and tell me, give me the three characteristics. Indeed, the uh, graceful way to your head and ornaments about your neck. Just tell me, where, where are the verbs in this verse? What are the verbs? Indeed. Okay, is indeed a verb or? Uh, are. The uh. are. Are. Uh? Yeah, uh. are. There you go. Are. Okay. Any other verbs? Indeed's a declaration. 
uh, interjection. Yeah. Mm. R is a verb. So, A R E. Any others? No others. Only R. No others. So you have it easy here. Just one. All right. Yeah. So tell us. R, R present. Good. Intense. The uh, subju subjunctive. Well, remember, subjunctive is the case of possibility. So if it were subjunctive, it would be. Uh, okay, indicative. Yeah, okay, it's indicative. indicative. Subjunctive would be maybe. They may be mm. a graceful, mm. but it's not may. It's so it's indicative. It's a declaration. And oh, what's active? Active. Active boys. Very good. Okay, good. All right. Ruel, we'll give this one to you. Verse 10. Brother Ruel, are you awake? Don't forget to unmute. Yes. A uh, verb. Where are the verbs here? Entice. Good. And do not consent. Yeah. All right. Okay, so let's look at first entice. What are the three characteristics? It's a uh, present tense. Very good. What kind of voice? Um, Active or passive? Passive. Oh, if sinners entice you, active. Yeah, the, the, the subject is doing the action, so it's active. Yes. And then what what's the mood? Imperative, indicative, subjunctive. Inter Is it a command? Indicative. It's indicative. It's just the statement. All right. How about uh, consent? Consent is present tense, active, and imperative. Very good. Okay. All right. Sandy, let, let me give you, you can take this one. Verse 11, Pastor Sandy. Come. Okay, good. Come. Let. Okay, let lie. Yeah, lie. Is that above here? Yeah. Let Wait. lie technically is the, the verb. Okay, what else? Wait. Let us lie in wait. Here it's being used as a noun, actually. Because notice the preposition. In wait. Yeah, to lie in wait. That's a, if I were to say wait for the bus, then I'm using it as a verb. But if I were to, when I say lie in wait, I'm using it as a noun. Adverb, Pastor Tim. Adverb. A noun. Yeah, it's this. It's I think a noun. It's uh, modifying the or it's the object of in there. It's kind of a funny phrase in English. It's an idiom. So uh, ambush. Ambush. Good. Let ambush. And actually, there's one more at the beginning. Hey, Say. Hey. Yeah. Hey. Okay. So yeah, you've got a few here now. Let's do say. Present. All right, President, what's the voice? Is it active or passive? Uh, wait a moment. I'm going to. Active. Yeah, it's active. The subject's doing the action. Passive. Then, okay. Uh, what's the mood? Imperative, okay. indicative. Yes. In English, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. No, in English. <laughs> means, uh, no worries. Active. It's a mood game. Yeah, the mood. Remember, the mood is. Uh, Statement. 
Sorry, I didn't catch that. My signal. Yeah, your signal. Someone want to help out? I think, yeah, he's having trouble uh, with his signal. Come with us, Imperative. What's wrong with my signal? Indicative. Yeah, the, the for say, say is indicative. But come, yeah, come <laughs> is present, active, and then uh, imperative. imperative, right? It's a command. Let lie. Present. It's present, good. Active. It's active. And is it what is the mood? Imperative still. It's still imperative. Imperative. But it's a third person. So we don't see this. Uh, we don't see this very much in English. We see it a lot in Hebrew and Greek. So when you want to make a command, like normally in English, right? Commands are uh, you know, like come. Right, come is second person, right? You, you come. And that's normally in English. But uh, if you want to do it in third person, like you wanted to, if you're in a group and you want to command everybody to do it with you, it's say, let us, let us go. Okay, that's a third person imperative. Okay, us is the subject. And you could do a first person. We see this often even in a let me go. That's a first person imperative. Okay, so if you see that word let in English, uh, then it is, it's an imperative, but it's not second person. It's either first or third person. Okay, now for those of you that like fancy words, here, I'll give you a fancy word. How about that? This is called the jussive, which is just a fancy way to say imperative in the third person. Okay? So, fancy way to say third person imperative. All right? So, if you want to sound smart in one of your sermons, you could say, so here we see a verb in the jussive. Um Actually, don't do that. But uh, so all that to say is that let lie and let ambush are both imperatives, but they're third person. So that's why you see that word let. OK. Anybody got any questions on that? OK. Now, notice, are we starting to see a pattern here? Uh, verse 8, imperative, imperative, <laughs> present imperative. Um, verse 10, we had a present imperative. Verse 11, present imperative, present imperative, present imperative. Okay. All right. Verse 12. Let's see. Uh, Eric, I'll have you do this one. Verse 12, identify the verbs and then tell us the three characteristics. Swallow. Okay, good. Swallow. Let swallow, right? Go down? Yeah. Okay, good. So let's now. What's the uh, three characteristics? Present. Present. Active. Good. <coughs> Indicative. Well, Just remember, see. we just talked about this. That let swallow. That's a, actually imperative, but it's a third person. Joseph, Joseph. <laughs> yeah, Joseph. Uh, yeah, there Joseph. we go. We have a Hebrew scholar here among us. It's Joseph. Yeah. So, but we call that imperative. It's a third person imperative. All right. It's a command, but given in third person. Okay. How about go down? Present, active, indicative. 
Very good. Present active. Indicative. Okay. Um, let's see. We'll just do a couple more. Edwin, you want to try this? Try one. Good morning. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Just identify the verbs and tell us uh, the three characteristics. Fine. Okay. Actually, we'll find, we'll find right? We'll find. Okay. And then we feel. All right. Now, tell us about uh, those verbs. We'll find. What's, what's the tense? Is it? Present. Is it? Is it future present? Been, future future yeah, notice, notice uh, that future. will. Yeah, future. We will find. That will tells us it's future. Okay. Now, is it active or passive? Is the subject doing the action? Uh, active. Good. And then is it a, a command, a question, a statement? Subjunctive. Indicative. Because... Uh, Okay, remember, indicative. 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 Let me just write these again. Uh, a certain for me, uh, for me, uh, okay. subjunctive. Okay. <laughs> okay, but do you see if it had said this, if it had said we may find future all kinds of precious wealth, that would be this would be subjunctive. That word may would tell us we don't know. It's only a possibility. But in this in the verse it says we will find. So there's no doubt. Okay. It's certain. So it's, it's a, yeah, it's indicative. Now, again, if it had said we may find or we might find, okay, those both introduce doubt. And so that would be subjunctive. All right. But in this case, we don't have any doubt. It's the, they're saying we will find. You know that, right? Positive. Okay, so so that is future active indicative. And then the same thing for um, Will Phil, right? Right, Edwin? Uh, yes. Future. Yep, future. Active. Good. Indicative. Yeah, it's indicative because again, there's no doubt introduced here. Okay, subjunctive is possibility. This is introduces doubt. So you'll see in English, you'll see these the helper verb here, my, may or might. Okay, if you see that, then that's telling you there's some doubt here about this action. But in, ver in this case, what actually is said is we will find. So there's no doubt in the speaker's mind. Okay. All right, good. Um, we'll do uh, one more here for this one. Let's have uh, uh, Macdo, are you around? Can you hear me? Yes, Pastor Teams. Good morning. Good morning. Why don't can you go ahead and uh, okay, identify uh, the verbs? Throw. Good. Shall. Uh, uh. There's one more. Shall. Yeah, shall 
Shall, shall what? Have. have. There you go. Shall have. Okay, good. All right, now for throw, tell me about that. What's the tense, the voice, the mood? Present. Good. It's an active. Very good. Uh, indicative. Okay. Indicative would be a statement. Is he giving a statement or? Uh, a throw is imperative. Very good. Yeah, he's giving a command here. Yeah. All right. Now, shall have. How about that one? Present. <laughs> is it present or is it future? Is he saying it's ha future they have it now or they will have it in the future? Ah, uh, future. Yeah, there you have. go. Okay, good. Active. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, indicative. Yeah, here's an indicative. He's not giving a command. He's making a statement, a declaration. All right, good. All right, Emmanuel, we're gonna give you uh, give you the next verse here. Verse fifteen. Identify the verbs and then uh, tell us characteristics of each verb. Walk, do not. Okay, good. Keep. Good. Those are it. All right. So do not walk. Do not walk. Uh, present. Yes. Active. It's a command. It's a command. So that's the uh, imperative. imperative, right? Imperative. Right. Very good. How about keep? Keep. Present. Present. Yes. Then active. Yes. Uh, imperative. All right. Good. Very good. All right. We'll do one more. Uh, Kenneth, let's give you the next one. Verse 16. Thank Run. you, Emmanuel. All right. Go ahead, Kenneth. Run and hasten. Okay, run. Hasten. Okay. <coughs> Tell me about those. A run is present. Active. Indicative. Okay. Yep. How about hasten? The same thing, yes. present, active, indicative. Now, there actually is one more verb in this passage. How about verse. shed, Pastor T? Oh, shed. shed, yeah, shed. Yeah, shed. Shed is a verb, but it's connected to this word, this preposition too. Do you remember what we call that? Infinitive. Infinitive. There Infinitive. You go. Okay, to shed. That's a present. Infinitive verb. Active infinitive. But Pastor Tim, isn't it that infinitive acts as a noun? Yeah. So here's the deal. Uh, infinitives are kind of an interesting uh, part of speech. Okay. They have the form of two plus a verb. Okay. And they can act like a noun or a, an adjective or an adverb. So they're sometimes difficult to figure out. So you have to see what it's doing in the sentence. Now, in this case, I think if you look at they hasten to shed blood. So how is this functioning here in this, in this line? What's the subject and verb? They. Okay. So the subject is they, the verb is Hey, uh, adjective. So how is to shed adjective. functioning here? 
Adjective. Modi- modify. Object. Adjective. Said... Well, if it's an adjective, it's modifying a noun. Adverb, pastor team. Adverb. It's an adverb. Okay, adverb would modify the verb. Yeah. Or it could be. Adjective. How about this? The object of the verb. It's an indirect object to the word blood. Yeah, well, blood is the object of to shed. So to shed. So blood is my infinitive phrase. And blood is the object of shed, right? To shed what? To shed blood. The question is, what is this infinitive phrase? How is it functioning? And it actually is acting like the object in this sentence. It's the object of the action. It's completing the thought. Modifies to his ten. Okay. Because you're asking, what do they hasten to do? To shed blood. Okay. It's not how they hasten. It's not why. Well, it could be why. You could have that. So I, I could see that. Okay. If, if you're saying it's an adverb answering the question why. Okay. That's a possibility. I think is that what you were thinking, Kenneth? That's right, Pastor Tim. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's a legitimate uh, option. Okay. So in this case, we could say it is it, it does appear to be functioning as an adverb. Modifying hasten. Okay. So keep keep on the lookout for those. You'll see them once in a while. Now we won't do the other the rest of the verses because I want to go on to the word study for a minute but but notice here what what you do is so you'll go through every every um every verse and just uh, identify the verbs and then what i want you to do is just notice if you see any patterns any type of verb repeated so what i did is here notice verses 8 through 15 are mostly imperatives from the author and from the sinners trying to entice, while verses 16 through 19 are mostly indicative, focusing on the result of the <laughs> sinner's actions. Okay? So I just want you to look to see if you can identify any, any patterns with the verbs. Because sometimes you may have like all of one kind of verb, and then you'll have another kind of verb sort of that, that doesn't follow the pattern and it can stick out. All right, and so here I just see a general idea of verses 16 to 19, almost all the verbs are indicative. You have a couple infinitives, but verses eight through 15 are almost all imperative. Either in a command from Solomon to his son or the commands from the sinners to his son as well, trying to entice him, okay? All right, the next thing to look for is just the pronouns. And so all you want to do is just go through, identify the pronouns, and here's why this is important. Let me sh let me go back to Okay, let's go. Let's just take a moment and do this. Uh Ruel, let me have you uh start start us off. Identify the pronouns here starting in verse 8. If you're there. Mm -hmm. Pronoun. My. Okay, my. My son. My. Who's your. That? Okay, who is that referring to? My refers to who? The writer. Okay, which we know his name in this case, right? Who's the author? Solomon. 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 Okay, here, my son, your. Okay, who is your referred to? Your. The son. The son. Okay, where's the next yeah. one? Your mother. Good. Referring to the son. Same. Referring to the son. Okay, verse nine. They. What does that refer to? Referring to the teaching and instruction. Very good. They are uh, raised to your 
your head. Okay. Referring to the sun's head. To the sun. Okay, good. And your neck. Referring to the sun's neck. To the sun. All right, good. All right, Kent. Let's uh, go to you, Kent. Verse 10. My son. Okay, my, who's that? Um, the author. Which is Solomon, right? Solomon. Yes. Okay. You. And who does you refer to? Uh, sinners. Oh, if sinners entice you, a uh, son. The son, right? Yes. All right. How about verse 11? Us. Who's that refer referred to? to? Uh, sinners. Yeah, and there's one other one before us. Uh, they, they. They, there you go. Sinners. Okay, do you us. see any more in verse 11? Us again? Yes. Us. Us again. Okay, why don't you do one more? Verse 12. Us, them. All right. Good. And them? Who is the them? Who does them refer to in verse 12? The innocent. Good. All right. Any others? Oh, innocent. Them. Yeah, innocent. Uh, innocent. Yeah, them. Yeah. Them refers to the innocent. Um, those. 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 Refers to the ones who go down to the pit, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Ramil, I'll have you do a couple of verses and then we'll go to the next step here. Verse uh, 13. We. There you go. We. Who does that refer to? Uh, all kinds. All people. We the people. Yeah. yeah. Who's speaking? The speaking and the the sons, the father and the son, we. Oh, the parent of the sinners. The sinners, right? It's the sinners are speaking here in verse 10, right? If the sinners say, we will find. So yes. that we goes back to verse 10, the sinners. Okay. okay? And we then, and how about, there's another we, correct? Yeah. Okay, verse 14, what do you see? 13 hours. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Good. I missed one. Our house. Who, who does that refer to, Ramil? Sinners. Yeah. Still the sinners talking here. Okay, now verse 14. Us. Your. Okay, we have us, but we have your, a, your before your. that. Who does your refer to? The same, yeah, on the audience. The son. Yeah, the son. The audience, right? Who in this case, it's the son. And then us refers to sinners. Sinners. Okay, the next, where's the next one? We. We refers to the same. The sinners. sinners again, right? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. All right, let's do, do one more. Verse 15. My. My, My good. Son. And who is that referred to? Solomon. Solomon? Yeah. Very good. Your. Okay, who does that refer to? Sons. The son? Okay, any others? Yeah. Them. Yeah, them. them, and them. Who is that? Them and their. Sinners. The sinners, right? Now Solomon is speaking to his son, referring to the sinners. Okay, good. So basically what you want to do is go through and identify, and this is what I've got here in the example, 
Here's all the pronouns that are used. And I also identify who it refers to. And this is very important. When you're looking at a passage, and you'll see a pronoun. You want to make sure you understand what it, who it refers to. All right, because that can be, that's very important to, to your interpretation. And notice all of these references to the sinners in verse 10. Most of the pronouns refer to them. Okay, and so that's what I put here in the pattern. Most pronouns refer to my son or to the sinners. The focus here is Solomon warning his son not to listen to the sinners who would try to entice him. Okay. All right. Mm. So what I'm just having you do is because when you look at each verse, you've got to be able to identify who the pronoun refers to. Otherwise, you could misinterpret the passage. And then, uh, you know, look for patterns, as I mentioned here. Most all the pronouns either refer to most of them refer either to Solomon's son or sinners. Now, there's a couple of other things here. The conjunctions. OK, those are just you can look for those. I, I noted them here. And then conditional clauses. We have two of them in this passage, verse 10 and 11. And then a purpose result statement. If we look at the passage here, notice verse 18 and 19 are the consequences or the result of basically verses uh, 10 to 15. Or specifically, it's the result of verse 16. They run to evil, they hasten to shed blood, but actually the result is they are the ones who will suffer. Okay? And then we see the clue here is so. So are the ways of everyone who gets. So that so is a summary statement, a consequence, a result. Okay? So uh, or so that or as a result or thus, those would be words that would show that, okay? Now, again, all we're doing here is we're just looking at this passage from another point of view. We're looking for certain other characteristics of this passage. We've done the poetic analysis. We've done the diagram. Now we're looking at specific grammatical features, especially the verbs. That's very important to understand what the verbs are doing. The verbs drive the action of the uh, of each of the passage and then a, uh, pronouns conjunctions these are all just certain things to look for uh, to pay attention to within the text all right and then last but definitely not least is the word study okay and let me get us to that point the word study it's going to be the same pattern or process that you you did in the psalms assignment for this just identify significant words, and at least five within your poem. And again, those significant words can be either a word that, that doesn't make sense to you, a word that perhaps is translated differently in each of the translations, a word that's a key verb or action, a repeated word, or maybe just a word that to you seems to be an important word. Uh, and so it, you can look up any word you want and do a word study, but uh, it takes a little time. So you want to be strategic and pick specific words that are going to be help you understand the passage better. So those would be, again, uh, the key verbs, uh, repeated words, or again, words that don't make sense to you, or like I said, uh, a word that's translated differently between the English translations, okay? And again, if you, you can go back to session 10 uh, and part of session nine, and we talk about this a little bit, all right? So you can review that if you want. But the pro procedure is simply look up the Strong's number. So go to Bible Hub. So for example, let's say that I wanna do, um, so let's do, let's do this, all right? We'll go to, let me open up Bible Hub. So you're studying your passage, and let's say, for example, uh, verse 10, that word entice. I'm like, what, I wonder what that word means. It seems to be an important word because it's, 
He's giving it as one of the conditions if sinners entice you. So what does that word entice mean? So let me go to my interlinear. All right, let me just set this up for you guys. Okay. All right, so I like I really like the biblehub.com interlinear. I think that's a good one to use. All right, I'm going to type in my passage here or first I'm going to hit interlinear. And then I'm going to type in my passage. And my passage is Proverbs 1 verse 10. Okay? So here we go. Here's the uh, Hebrew interlinear. So notice the Hebrew words are given here. And remember, in Hebrew, you go from right to left, not left to right. So in Hebrew, we have my son, if, and here's my verb, entice. Okay? So that's the verb I'm interested in. So I'm going to look up the Strong's number here. Okay? It's the number right above it. I'm going to hit that. And now I've got all this wonderful information. All right. I've got the, the Hebrew word here, pata. Okay, is the how you pronounce it. And then I've got the definitions here. I've got other passages where the word is used on the right. Um, I've got the concordance, how it is defined from the concordance. Okay, and so I get I got a lot of information here to help help me from biblehub.com. And so then all you need to do is compile that information in the following way. Like I said, look up the Strong's number and then identify from other translations how the word is translated. And then identify, at least if you can, 10 other passages where the word is used. Now, preferably find other passages in Proverbs if you can where that same word is used. If you can't, that's fine, uh, but start there, okay? And then summarize the meaning of the word in your the context in your own words. So let's say I have the word entice. The Strong's number is here. The different ways that the uh, different definitions. Then I took uh, definitions from the lexicon and, and the other passages that have the word in it. And then I noticed every single English translation translates it as entice. I looked at seven of them. Okay, that's significant. That tells me that that's, you know, if all those translations look at this word and they all come up with the same word, then that's probably the best word, <laughs> the best word to translate it in English, okay? And then... I've got all the passages where that word is used, or 10 of them at least. And I know I summarize how it's used in each of those passages. It's the idea of trying to deceive someone or to persuade them to evil. And that's really my summary of the word. The word entice is a good translation because in the context of Proverbs 1, it carries the idea of sinners trying to get someone to join them in their evil behavior, making false claims of success. So they're trying to deceive him, okay? So that's it. It's uh, simply, you can go to the Bible Hub, interlinear. You can get a lot of information from there that's very helpful. And then here's the, the steps for it, okay? But the key is I want you to give me a summary in your own words. Okay, what does that word mean in your passage then? Based on the definitions you found, based on how it's used in the other uh, other passages and based on other translations. Okay. Well, that's a lot of information I'm trying to, to give you here. Are there any questions on that? Again, this should just be review. Uh, we've done this assignment before, <laughs> but I know it's been a couple months. So I wanted to. So, anybody have any questions? We're okay. Yeah. 
Okay. okay. And again, I will post this as example of this assignment for you so you can look at it, just follow the same format. Uh, one other thing I want to mention to you guys is uh, the schedule here a little bit is um, we're now right here. So in a few days, assignment number five needs to be done. So really work at getting caught up if you're, you're behind. I do have, uh, we're not meeting next week. I'll be, uh, I have another uh, obligation that I have to attend to. So that will give you a couple weeks then to get to the next assignment or to get caught up, all right? So let's really work at it because my goal is to be basically able to start the next module um, you know, by the end of April, okay? So we really have to get all these assignments completed in the next uh, few weeks so you can have your sermon preached by uh, the middle of April, okay? That's our target right now, okay? So there's still time, but really work at catching up if you need to. I've posted examples for all of these assignments for you guys uh, using a Proverbs passage as an example. So uh, hopefully, you know, everything's there. But again, any questions, you're always welcome to message me and, uh, and ask, and I'd be happy to do that, okay? Do you guys have any, in the last couple minutes here, anybody have a specific question about their passage they want to ask me? Mr. Tim, my question yes, is, I have already submitted my Im imagery, critic device analysis, but I follow the old uh, example that you have posted on the canvas. It's okay? That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, because uh, last, I think two weeks ago, a couple of weeks, I, I already passed my image using the old. Example. Yeah, that's that's okay. Now I'm working with the diagram. I, I think I have a lot of things to do in the verb and the pronouns. Okay, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very poor of this, this thing. I'm sorry. No problem. Very poor. <laughs> that's okay. That's We keep working at it just to, to learn, okay? So yeah. So that's good. It's thanks good. That you're... I, 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 I thanks that I attended this uh, Zoom meeting. Now I learned uh, a little bit. <laughs> okay. Not much. Because <laughs> <laughs> imperative, imperative, I don't know. <laughs> Very poor person. <laughs> yeah, just do, do your best. And like I said, if, if you have other questions you want to ask me later, that's, that's perfectly fine. But uh, yeah, if any of you have done the assignment already and you follow the a previous format, that's okay. Um, uh, I know we've sort of stretched this module out because of COVID. So, um, so some of you turned in your assignments some time ago and uh, followed the format that was on Canvas and that's perfectly fine. I would encourage you though, uh, if you haven't, you know, put your sermon together to sort of review these, my uh, uh, examples I'm sending you go and review your passage. Even if you did the assignment a while ago, uh, review that so you can be fresh as you prepare your sermon. But I would say target to have your sermon document done in the next four weeks. Okay. So by March 26, have that, have that done so then you have, can preach it after that, okay? And I think that's, that's a good amount of time. Just, you know, give a few hours each week and you'll, I think you can get caught up, okay? Okay. All right. All right, so Kent, since you opened us in prayer, can you close us in prayer? Okay, certainly. Thank you.